Uh, so I've been working in academia for a very long time, and this talk is inspired for someone how I was maintaining this um, this year. Um, it's basically like science is built on the top of giants, right? Uh, and those giants look scary. Look like oh. How are we going to do it? But sometimes giants are just windmills. Uh, granted, windmills who speak weird English, who publish way too many papers, and it's basically impossible to keep up. So I hope this story sounds familiar, um, because what I'm trying to do is, for the next half an hour, even less, a little bit less, I'm going to be your squire, and I'm going to try to give you the tools to read papers properly. So there's a two folds to this talk. On one hand, I will try to give you tools to, for reading papers. And every time I talk about this, it's like my Erin coworker says, but I know how to read papers. And I was like, let me show you how to. Uh, and the second part is like a more computer science part where I will give you some tools to implement a paper. In this case, we're going to look at the very, very famous attention is all you need. And as a co-worker told me, um, we all use transformers. So yeah, let's do it. So yeah, how to read academic papers. So there are some tools that I think everyone should know uh, about it uh, for implementing, for reading academic papers. And as I said, it was not like, yeah, I read papers. I sit and I read. I print them and I read them. No, don't do that. Um, first of all, and I think like the most important tool are repositories. Um, because we all been there. Like we have hundreds of hundreds of tabs open with different papers, blog posts, YouTube videos, podcasts, like these days, science is distributed across multiple mediums. And we have everything open and never have time to read them. So we need something to properly collect and categorize everything. My main the main thing that it needs to have to have these tools is to be distributed, like multi-platform. Um, I need to be able to be in on my phone and see a paper and save it and then maybe label it, but it needs to be distributed. So uh, Mendeley and Sotera are like the old school tools, uh, but also I really, really like paper, like paper pile. I don't know, it feels like a pile of papers I'm never going to read, but I'm trying. Um, and then note-taking. Uh, again, note-taking could be pen and paper, but if you like digitalized tools and then being able to do nice summaries and, and share them across the internet, um, I find that good notes and notability are very good tools. And finally, organizing. Sometimes you read a paper because you think it are, it's interesting, but it might not be interesting at that moment. And you need to be able to come back and remember that paper. Again, Notion, good notes, paper pile, and paper pile, and Obsidian are very good tools for doing that. And that's basically it. That's the tools that you need for reading papers. Almost. I have a couple of bonus tracks. Um, first, the first bonus track is a tool for discovering new papers. Granted, Twitter is my main way of, for me to discover papers. Like academic Twitter is very. Like, yeah, it's there. You get papers, new papers every day. But that might be skewing you to big labs, big corporations. So um, research, research Rabbit and lead maps will find you papers related. Then they're linked to each other. And then for my neurodivergent family, there's bionic reading. Then that's very, something very, very cool and will help us read better. OK, so we have the tools, but how we need to read it. Hopefully, the repository has helped you massively. Like, you don't have these tools open, so you should be able to read. Cool. Um, so now what? Like, now we sit on a, on a desk and have like 200 cup of, cups of coffee, and we read through them cover to cover. Well, no, because that's infeasible. Like, please be kind with yourself. Like, no knight is able to read everything. So I do this thing. I do the three-pass approach. The first approach is me trying to figure it out. Is this paper relevant? Like, I'm, and I'm trying to be brutal. Like, I'm not going to spend more than 15 minutes doing this. I read the title. I read the abstract. Skim a little bit through the introduction. Maybe read the discussion. And that's it. Nothing else. 
then is like the moment where I maybe know that the paper is interesting. I might start brewing a cup of coffee because I'm going to need to read this. Again, no cover to cover, just the introduction, the contributions and the limitations. My favorite authors always have like this last paragraph with these are the contributions and they itemize their contributions and the limitations. That is fantastic. Please, authors in the room, do that. I will be very grateful. And then I will read these figures and the results sections. Depending on how expert, expert you are on the topic, this might be more or less useful. Um, and yeah, skim through the rest of the paper, grab more or less the idea of what the paper is about, and write a summary. Granted, it's not going to be the best summary. It's just like, well, these topics are discussed in this paper. Cool. We're good. And then the next phase is when we properly need multiple cups of coffee and sit and read it cover to cover. There's no shortcut here. We need to read it for properly. Um, say not to, like, you don't need to read it alone. Like, find help, find colleagues. Asking for help is a sign of strength, not weakness. Um, and something that I also do is when I'm reading the paper cover to cover, I also add new papers to the repository so I know where to follow the lead. And extend the summary. At this point, you have a way better idea of what you're going to talk about. A brief, brief note on how to highlight papers. Um, since I do these three phases stage, which is, I think, pretty common, um, maybe not, um, I do this thing, like, because sometimes I read the paper, but I'm not going to implement it, or maybe I'm going to take almost a year since I read it again. So I have this semaphore thing where I, I highlighted in red the hypothesis, uh, the problem that the authors are trying to solve. In yellow, the um, hypothesis of the or the methodology that the, paper, that the authors are proposing. And finally, in green, I highlight the evidence, then back up the hypothesis. OK, and how does this look in, pra in practical? So this is my first pass. Very few things. This is basically like the only things that I highlighted are the things that I read. Basically, this takes 15 minutes for real. This is the second pass, when I really highlighted more things, go through the figures. Like, here I'm trying to pay more attention. Here I have, like, an idea, an idea of what Transformer look like. And this is the third pass. Um, no, this is not the attention that you need, but I wanted to show you this paper that was very recently published in fact that is values encoded in machine learning because we think the machine learning is neutral and hopefully from last day, yesterday keynotes, you know that it's not. Um, so, and here you can see that I'm doing, oh, it's a pointer. Okay, so here you see that I'm doing annotations, like things happening when I'm reading. And when I'm finally, I go to a summary, so I go back to paper pile and I write this summary. That's it. Now I have a very good idea of what the transformer looks like, how is it going to, how they do, what, problem, what methodology they follow, what Proofs I have, okay. So if I need to implement it, I know how to do it. Great. And now let's implement an academic paper. But before I jump into that, let's have a quick think on what transformers are. I feel like everybody knows what a transformer is. So um, indulge me and let's go through it together. So a transformer is actually a family, a family of neural networks. It looks more or less like this diagram. This is the original diagram, so it has like a color branch and the color branch. And it's very, very popular because it allows parallelization of, the, of some tools. Like recurrent neural networks were very slow because you need to go through the whole recursion. Um, and here we have some parallelism, which allow us to train faster. And then we have the new magical block attention, which allow us to come to capture relationships, long distance relationship in a sequence. And finally, we have positional encodings. Positional encodings is, are very important because it allows us to know what's the position of the token in the sequence. Because if you think about it, it's not the same if I say no at the beginning of a sentence or at the end, it might change the meaning. Okay, so positional encodings. As I was just saying, sequencing problems need to understand the order of the sequence. Uh, the authors use a sinusoid, um, sinusoid to encode the position, so 
every token, at every time step, it has a deterministic token, a deterministic uh, bet and ve vector. And they basically sum it. It's sum the word embeddings with the positional embeddings, and that's it, that's positional encodings. You're more than welcome to try other positional encodings. There's no rule, but I don't know why. Well, you know, um, inertia. We all use sinusoid. And what's the attention block? So the attention block is where you're trying to capture the similarities between two words, two words in a in the sequence. This is very easy to understand when you're talking about translation. So for example, the word windmills are translated in Spanish as molinos, and you want to be able, when you're doing translation, to know that the words might not be aligned, might not be in the same place, but the word molinos are very tight, is very tight with, uh, with windmills. So you need to have like this relationship, and that's what attention is trying to capture. So we have the I lost one thing. So we have the embeddings must plus the positional encoding. We um, project that into a smaller vector space. We do the dot product between the uh, query and the keys. If the query and the keys belong to the same sequence, that's self-attention. If the query and the keys belongs to an input and an output se sequence, like for example, the translation case, um, that's cross-attention. Okay, then we project it and it's a nonlinear projection. And then we compute another dot product and we get the attention coefficients. And that's the, all the magic, all the sugar spice and everything nice that makes transformers. So basically in summary, we have an encoder branch that have this multi-headed attention because that mechanism that I just showed you is repeated multiple times. Then we have the coder, uh, the decoder branch and have multi-headed attention and cross attention, feed forwards, and normalization. Add layers and normalization layers. The add layers is because we are actually also writing in the residual. That's the dot lines that connect in between. And that's it. And now let's do uh, the quickest introduction to JAX. This is not a prescription tool. It's like um, there's a myriad tools out there that you can use. And by all means, pick up the best for your needs. Having said that, we actually like, love JAX. So, uh, why we love JAX? Um, JAX is a NumPy-like um, library that runs on accelerators. That means that if you knew NumPy, you kind of know JAX as well. It's kind of, yeah. I mean, like, I was thinking for that for a very, very long time. It's, then it's not completely true. And the good thing of JAX is they have these transformations I'm going to explain in a minute. And this is the promise land. Like, you have the predict function, then takes the inputs, compute the dot product, adds the bias, adds a non-linear a non function, and then compute the mean square root. And basically, I switch, I switch NumPy by J NumPy, and yeah, that's it. That's brilliant. So if it's exactly the same, why do this change? So we do the change because we have transformations. Um, we have CRUD is the CRUD and JIT is going to are going to be the most common transformations. CRUD basically takes a function and returns the gradient of the original function. If you want to get the values and the gradient, because you might want to get the gradient and you want to compute the loss, you have the value and grad. And then you have JIT, which is a just-in-time compilation. Uh, what it does basically does a trace of your program, and then um, traces the program and writes an intermediate representation in JAXPR. Um, normally, the trade-off be between flexibility and fastness is uh, shape array. That's the level of traceness, tracer, uh, which is like we keep the shape of the array, but we don't keep the values. So you can operate in different batches, but all the batches need to have the same shape. Cool. Um, oh, I I forgot to show you. It's, it's here. Look how, ah, oh, what did I do? It's, it's here. Look how easy. Crowd and JIT. And you have the gradient function, trace. Brilliant. Um, and then you have vectorization and parallelization. Vmap and Pmap are quite similar. Vmap works on batches, and Pmap works across devices, which allow us to do gradient per examples and parallel gradients. We could not train the big, big neural networks and we are training at the moment without them. Okay, 
So let's implement a transformer. It's been a long time. We have been walking a long time by the road and it's like, well, that was it. Well, it was not. Um, we don't really work on JAX because JAX is function, uh, function oriented and has like tons of boilerplate and we don't like to write the same thing over and over again. So what we do is we have this very nice library haiku then allow us to write object oriented like models and you have the haiku, haiku module then builds this model and has like some parameters and the function to apply to the inputs. And they, these models need to be initialized because we need somehow to work to work, go from regular functions to pure functions. So we need haiku transform and they gave us the init and the apply, pure versions of the function. Okay, now we're here for real. Brilliant. So now we have the embedding block and the embedding block has the positional encoding and the embedding block and the embedding the, token, the word embeddings, it's not really word embeddings because we all use sentence space, but yeah. And you can see then the most common modules like, yeah. I keep thinking I use this wrong button. Okay, so you have HK embed, and since we have the parameters, we can tell, hey, get the position embedding, and then we sum it, and that's it. We add both them, and we're good to go. The attention block that we were just talking about is this thing. And again, we do some housekeeping to know if it's self-attention uh, self or cross-attention. And then we call the parent because multi-headed attention is such a common module that is already implemented. Um, yeah, And also very important, please remember that you need to add castle masks if you're doing cross-attention because you don't want to learn from something that you should not have seen in the current, current time step. It's obvious, but it has led to a lot of bugs. The feedforward network, the feedforward layer, um, basically initialize the, initialize the, variable, the, the, initialize the variable, computes the linear, adds like jello, and returns the linear. Very, very common things. So it's really simple to implement we don't need to do a lot of things. And here's the whole transformer. Maybe this is too small. Oh, you're seeing it? When does this happen? I thought that you were seeing the slideshow. Brilliant. Um, so, uh, yeah, this might be too small for you to read, but uh, what I want you to see is that it's very, very similar to all the other tools. Basically, you have the attention block, you have the, ah, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, okay, cool. You have the attention block, a dropout, and you can see here the normalization. It takes the attention and the um, residuals, so something then has not passed through the attention. So if something is meaningful, we keep it. And then the feed forward block, a dense layer, dropout, and layer norm. And we repeat this multiple times. Cool. Um, and then we have to build the, fo the forward function. This is a slightly different to other toolkits, but it's not something completely insane. It's basically get the tokens, get the embedding block, get the transformer block, and apply the transformer. And that's it. The last function is similar, very, very, very similar to the first thing that we saw at the beginning. So you get the whole, the one hold embedding of the target. See, this is like, I'm completely sure that even though this might be the first time that you see Jax, you're perfectly capable of reading this code because you might already know NumPy. Yeah, provided that you need, no, you already know NumPy. If not, yeah, it might be a little bit tricky. Cool, and we have a lovely call up. Then I'm going to be able to present. Which is basically, I'm going to share it online, but it's basically everything that you do. Um, we need to install like a couple of libraries. This might not be big enough. Okay. Okay, you might need to start a couple of libraries. Um, you need to build the sentence piece, but everything is like these days are so easily accessible. Like TensorFlow Hub has a sentence piece tokenizer, then you can basically import, and all these are the model, the model parameters, then you are more than welcome to tune. 
even though some models are, the dropout rate is pretty much standard. Um, and then you load the data set. This data set is both in TensorFlow Hub and in Hugging Face, so you can decide how you want to mix the things. The embedded block that we just see, but now with a little bit more of boilerplate. The attention block, again, with a little bit more of boilerplate. Forward, I'm going to skip everything we just saw. And here you define the update function, which is basically get the um, get the key, apply, apply, get the key in order to make it reproduce, repro reproducible, apply the optimizers, and return the new state. That's absolutely it. And when you train a model, I train for a very long, a very little time, but you can see that the lo loss is getting lower. So let's take it for a good sign. Okay, uh, let's go back to this. And So the, take, the main takeaways take that I hope you get from this talk is, first of all, find the right system that allow you to keep in up with the literature. There's no good tools. I hope that some of the tools I presented to you are useful, but by all means, find the one that is useful for you. Be smart about how you read papers, like you don't need to read absolutely everything. And then if a paper is relevant to you, summarize it and store it somewhere safe then you can go back and remember. Um, I have a colleague who the other day told me that they keep the, all the papers on their brain and I was like, no, one, don't do that. Okay, so on transformers, I remember that the key things for a transformer is that it allows parallelization, therefore faster tra training times. A lot of new flavors of transformer has improved the long range distance, but it has hard the training times, so. That's a caveat. Um, attention allows us to um, capture information into long range distances. The longer the context, the better for the prediction. That's why a lot of new variations like S4 try to improve the context, but then if you want to put it in production and do run experiments with them, it might be too slow. And finally, positional encodings, then capture the absolute position of the tokens in a sequence. And finally, uh, for implementing papers, we will need to implement papers uh, for either our academic career, for our business career. Um, find the right tool to implement the paper. Like, there's always a trade-off between flexibility and being able to modify things. So there's no right answer. Find the best for you. Um, we really like JAX because it's very easy to jump in, and it allows us to do a lot, a lot of things. And on top of that, when we don't like Jax, we have Haiku, which is a Jax library that allows us to write normal Python code. And that will be me. Um, let's build amazing new roads. And uh, please, 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 if you implement new systems, new machine learning models, be conscious about your users, be conscious about the repercussions. This is not a black box, like we understand what's happening. And there's a massive new research on interpretability and trying to understand the depths of the transformer. So I hope yesterday talks gives you like an idea of what's happening in the field. Um, but also be happy, like, like I'm very cheerful about the future. I think it's bright because we have all these new tools and all these new Blooming research, um, and yeah, that will be me. Ah. If you want to have some time for questions, I'll be more than welcome. Yeah, we have time for questions. Yeah, sorry, I rushed through, so. Hey. Jax looks pretty cool. I haven't seen it before. What would be um, reasons that you might move over from something like PyTorch, um, either in a research setting or more particularly in a production setting? It allows way more flexibility than PyTorch. Um, and then it's like business reason. Like Py Jax is implementing within the company. So we have like the original developers that we can ask. Mm -hmm. And it's very like um, set up for our settings. Like it's, it's very. It works very well with our TPUs, with our CPUs, and people 
just use it. But again, it's like try to find the right tool. Mm -hmm. I think from my experience, I'm an old machine learning um, practitioner and I used TensorFlow on the past. I never used PyTorch. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like PyTorch, it allows us more high-level development. Uh, I'm not sure if I want to touch something, like if I want to get a gradient with respect to different variables, how is it going to be done? Mm -hmm. So it probably is like, let's find a tool that is right for you. Maybe you just want to import a transformer and you don't care how many layers you have. You just want to say this is the main things that I want to modify, but you don't need to do something like fine grain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is there much of an ecosystem, sorry. Is yeah, go for it. Is there much of an ecosystem, you know, on papers like code, papers with code, is there a lot of like Jack's models up there or is it still kind of developing? Yeah, yeah. Um, so Google, most of their research is either in Jack's or TensorFlow, all our research that we open source is Jack's these days. Uh, so there's a lot of things. Obviously not as much as other people. We don't open source that much, sadly, uh, but for a good reason too. Um, but yeah, that's a good ecosystem out there. Cool, thank you. Thank you. All right, well thank you so much thank for you. your time and your talk. Thank you. Yeah.